we will commence reading in verse number one down to verse number four. When you have it, can you signify by saying amen? amen. If you don't have it, say wait on me. Wait on me. Okay. <laughs> We're not going to wait long. Somebody say, wait now, I say on the Lord. God bless you. Thank you for the update. Amen. Verse number one, it reads accordingly and says, After this, somebody shout after this. I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. There was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord on tonight. Amen. It's good to see you. Uh, my friends, the Baguettes. Amen. God bless you. Praise the Lord. I didn't know y'all were in this area. And so praise the Lord for you. Even long time viewers of my father's ministry. Amen. Verse number one again. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Now, I want to look at the first two words of this verse and use it as our focal point on tonight. Somebody shout after this. That's my subject tonight. Written by the Apostle John. Of course, the book of Revelation is a book that is widely regarded as one that is difficult to understand because of its symbolism. Revelation is a book of symbols. It is one that most theologians have grappled with down through the years. It is a prophetic book. In fact, it is the book of prophecy in the New Testament scriptures as a part of our canon. You have the four gospels. You have the book of history, which is the book of Acts. You have the 14 Pauline epistles, the letters written by Paul, and then you have the seven general epistles written by other apostles, John, Peter. Then you have the one book of prophecy, the book of Revelation. Of course, when they were canonizing the scriptures, they were deciding which book to include relative to being a part of the canon. They were deciding between the book of Revelation and they were deciding between the, I think it's called the Apocalypse of Peter. Even though the Apocalypse of Peter reportedly was not written by Peter. And they discovered that there were many discrepancies in the Apocalypse of Peter that contradicted other texts of the New Testament canon. So when they examined the book of Revelation, they discovered that what John had said, what he said and wrote based on what he saw, there was no contradiction. Everything that he said fit like a glove relative to other New Testament writers and even Old Testament writers. If you know the book of uh, the Revelation or the history of the book of Revelation, you would understand that, that John, the Apostle John, wrote this book, praise God, while he was banished to the Isle of Patmos. They put John on the Isle of Patmos as a prison island. They sent him there as a last resort because they, they tried to kill him. You know, the, the history lets us know that all of the apostles died martyrs' deaths. All of them died, all of them were killed. Paul beheaded, Peter 
crucified upside down. James pierced through with a sword. Thomas uh, pierced through with spears by Hindu priests in Pakistan. All of the apostles died martyrs death with the exception of John. John, praise the Lord, was fortunate to live to, uh, to see a full age. Praise God. And it was not for the sake of them not trying because they tried to kill John. History lets us know that they, they put John in a pot of boiling oil. And they turned the heat up. They, they left him there to see them to cook in that pot. When they came back the next day, they found that John was still alive. Not only was he still alive, but his clothes weren't even smoking. Not only was he still alive, but his lungs hadn't even uh, filled up with smoke. He was in perfect condition. They wondered what happened, and John said that, that God got in this pot with me. And I think that there's somebody in this house tonight that can testify that you've been in some smoky situations in your life. You can testify that the fact that I'm still alive is an indication that God got in my pot with me. Oh, I wish I was talking to somebody in here that had a testimony that knows that you should not be here on tonight. Amen. But if it had not been for the Lord who was on your side, do I have a witness in here? Amen. Tell somebody he got in my pot with me. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. They tried to kill him. They tried to kill him, but, but they couldn't kill him. Amen. They tried to take him out, but they couldn't take him out because God had his hand on his life. And, and, and there's somebody in here watching online that can identify with that because all your life you can testify that God has had his hand on me. Amen. I should have died a long time ago, but, but God had his hand on me. I believe I heard the brother say I was, he was born premature. Amen. But God had his hand on your life. I, I remember the testimony of my mother. Praise God when she was giving birth to my brother, my youngest brother, younger brother rather. Amen. And she said that while she was at the hospital in the delivery room, there was a doctor that came in. And, the, and instead of working on her, he put his hands around her neck and began to choke her until he tried to choke the life out of her and, and she couldn't breathe and, but she, she was able to muster up enough strength to call on the name of Jesus. When she called on the name of Jesus, all she had to do was say it just one time. That doctor released his hands and, and ran out of the room. Amen. My father came in and she said, well, there's a doctor that came in and tried to choke me. He said, do you know what she, what he looked like? She described him and he went out to try to find him and couldn't find him and, and asked the nurses, there's a doctor here that tried to kill my wife. They said, sir, we don't have a doctor here that looks like that. She came back in and told my mother and she said, well, it must have been a demon. The devil tried to take me out, but thank God, God was in this delivery room with me. Amen. You ought to thank God for his divine protection. You have a witness in here. There's been some stuff. Thank God that the devil tried to do that many of us never even knew about. Praise God. And we won't find out about it till we get to heaven. The attempts, the number of attempts that the enemy tried on our lives. And, but, but God was a hedge around us. God had our six. Do I have a witness in here? Amen. You ought to give God praise for the things that did not happen. And the stuff that I don't even know about. Oh yeah, so yeah. There's some stuff that you don't know about. Amen, that God blocked. But John, they tried to kill John. They, they tried to take him out. But God had his hand on his life. And, and he says, I've got purpose for you, John. Uh, amen. Uh, and you remember Peter. Peter tried to find out what was going to happen to John. Amen. Way back in St. John, I believe it's chapter number 20. Praise God. He tried to find out what was going to happen to John because God told Peter, thank God, that he was going to die a martyr's death. Peter looked and looked around until he saw John and he said, well, Lord, what about this man? What shall this man do? And, and Jesus did not tell Peter what was going to happen to John, but he knew that he had a plan for John's life. He had a plan for John just like he had a plan for Peter. Amen. He knew that John's life would take him, praise God, to a prison island. He knew that John's life would, would take him to a place in which he would receive a greater revelation and be able to see God in a way, thank God, that Peter never even saw him. 
Oh yes, Peter was a great man, and praise God, not trying to compare apostles, and Peter was a great man in his own right, but John had a unique perspective, because God gave John some revelation, and showed John some things that Peter had not seen. Amen. Even while John is banished here, thank God, I'm not going to preach long tonight, even while he is banished here to this prison island, amen, this island where John is elderly, but, but yet he still has to work in the mines. Praise God, six days a week, some 14 hour days. And thank God, without a lunch, no labor laws. And they just work them. Praise God, until they try to work them to death. Amen. The scripture, the history lets us know that, that they worked them six days a week and gave them one day off. And that day was Sunday. Praise God. And John called that day the Lord's Day. Amen. He wrote in the first chapter, and he says that I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And, and he says, I heard a voice behind me that, that said, John, look up. I am the beginning. I am the end. I am the alpha. I am the omega. I am he which was, which is, and which is to come. It is an interesting thing to understand that John has an encounter with God while he is bound in prison. John has an experience with God while he is in captivity. He has an experience with God while he is handcuffed and cannot move. It does not matter where you are, brothers and sisters. You can have an experience with God no matter where you are. You may be in a hellhole right now in your life. You may be going through, thank God, a difficult time. But God told me to tell you, you can learn something about me. Amen. No matter where you are, you can, you can learn something about me. No matter how dark your life gets, you can learn something about me. Even when you can't see your way out, as long as you can open your eyes and get a revelation of me, I will help you to make it through. Do I have a witness in this church today? You want to clap your hands and shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah another time. Amen. Sometimes we, we don't need deliverance. We just need a revelation. Amen. I wish I could preach here tonight. I said sometimes we don't need deliverance. We just need a revelation. Amen. Because if you get delivered, amen, something else will take captive of you. But when you get revelation, when you learn something about God that you did not know before, amen, that revelation can carry you through every trial, every difficulty, every dark day. Jesus. He, he saw him in a way, praise God, that he did not see him before. He opened his eyes and God gave him a vision. Amen. He saw Jesus in his priestly garments, if you will. Amen. He looked at him and said his hair was white like wool. He looked at him and said his eyes were, were like a flame of fire. He looked at him and said his feet were like polished brass. He heard him and he said his voice thundered. You know, amen. When you have a real experience with God. Can't nobody talk you out of what you have seen about here. Do I have a witness up in here? Well, I may as well tell you like this. Amen. Saints need to stop complaining. Thank God when they get sick and get in trouble. Because if you had never got sick, how would you know that God was a healer? Preach up in here. If you had never been in trouble, how could you testify that 
testimony preacher. I got my own testimony. I got my own God story. I can testify for David as to the power of God. Do I have a witness in this church today? You want to clap your hands and shout, thank you. Yeah, shout, thank you another time. John saw him. John saw him. John saw him in prison. He saw him in bondage. He saw him in a tight place. You can get a revelation of Jesus. Thank God no matter where you are. You have a witness in here. And John began to write. Thank God because God, the angel told him. What I'm showing you, John, I want you to write. I want you to write it down. And I want you to take what you wrote. Make seven copies of it. And you know they didn't have staples back then. They didn't even have a kinkos back then. And so he had to write seven copies. He had to write them all down. And then send them to the seven churches of Asia. Anybody read the Bible like I do? Amen. He had to write. Thank God everything that God showed him. And the things that God said don't write. He could not write those things down. And he wrote these, uh, praise God, prophecies. And I want you to understand what John wrote in the first two, three chapters. What God showed John, he showed him, thank God, the entirety of the church dispensation. Oh, can I preach this for about 10 more minutes? Lift your hands and shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah another time. He shows him the entirety, thank God, of the church dispensation. What is the church dispensation? It is that 2,000 year period, thank God, in which God would be pouring out the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It began, praise God, on the day of Pentecost in AD 33. In Acts chapter number 2, you know the Bible scripture. Was fully come. They were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, filled all the house. Whether well, you know the story, the Bible says they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in tongues. I still believe in the Holy Ghost that speaks in tongues. I'm not with this new day. All that is that the Holy Ghost is just goosebumps and hair standing up on the back of your neck. Maybe that's your Holy Ghost, but that's not. And the church dispensation, he divided it. Thank God in the seven periods. Amen. We call it the seven churches of Asia. But really what it is is the seven ages of the church dispensation. Amen. A period of 2,000 years in round number. Thank you, sir. Amen. In chapter 2, the first age, Ephesus. And what you'll understand as you walk through the second chapter and walk through the third chapter. Church in different time periods. The same church, praise God, going through time from the day of Pentecost all the way to our day. Stay with me, I'm going somewhere. Amen. In chapter number two, he begins with the church in Ephesus. He says, This church started out good. Amen. You started out on a high note. The age of the apostles, you know, you started out good. But by the end, the age. You lacked your first love. You stopped doing the things that you used to do. You stopped praying like you used to pray. You stopped singing the songs that you used to sing. And you know we would sing a song today. Oh Zion, what's the matter now? You don't pray like you used to pray. What's the matter now? Well, that was the church in that time. And he tells them Not 
popular today. But if there is a word that the church needs to hear, is that word repent. That word that means turn around. That word that means change. Because repentance is the key to salvation. No matter where you are in the scriptures, do I have a witness in this church today? Amen. The church, they got in Smyrna. They got the church in Smyrna had a problem. And this is a time when false doctrine began to seep in and creep into the church. They thank God and Satan. The Bible says God said, I know where Satan's seat is. His seat was right now in the church. He had gained a foothold. Thank God after the apostles had died.
church uh, and go find me another church. Uh, you can find just about whatever you want today. Uh, this is the age now of options. Uh, and if they can't find a physical church that they want to be in, uh, they said, I'll just stay at home uh, and watch church online. Uh, and this is why, Brother Pete Bishop, uh, I tell everybody, I come across a uh, Amen. That if you've never heard your favorite preacher even preach about the rapture, you better find you a new favorite preacher because God's preachers are supposed to be getting the people ready for heaven. Y'all don't want me to preach. Can I be myself for a few minutes? God looked at the church in this day and looked at us and diagnosed our condition. He said, You are, you say that you are rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing. And he was right because we got more than what we've never had before. We drive the Mercedes Benzes and BMW. Trying to criticize nobody. Let me use myself as an example. We drive in Lexuses. We live in big fancy homes on the golf course. We got money in 401ks and high positions in the corporate America. We are rich and increased with good. And we say we have nothing. And Paul says something that suppose that game is godliness. Then because I got a lot of stuff, I may be what God wants me to be. But I heard Jesus say, but you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And the worst condition is that you don't even know it. Lift your hands and shout glory. Shout glory another time. He said you are wretched. The apostle Paul said, oh, he said, oh, wretched man that I am. He was describing his condition. Trying to live for God with no power. And that's the age, that's the condition of the church today. We are trying to serve God, but we don't have the power that we used to have. The reason why we lack the power is because we don't consecrate like we used to consecrate. Y'all don't want me to preach. He said, You are wretched. You are miserable. What is the miserable condition? Thank you. I'm glad you asked. I believe my sister quoted it during testimony, sir. Paul said, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men. Most miserable. In other words, if all I'm expecting is what is limited to this life, and I don't look for anything in the life to come, I'm going to be a miserable person. And I am miserable because I'm not going to get everything that I want in this life. I may never get rich or have enough money to do this and that. But there's something coming beyond in the life that is to come. Seven. 
seven stages of spiritual perfection. Add to your faith virtue. Add the virtue, knowledge, knowledge, temperance. Temperance, patience, patience, godliness. And godliness, brotherly kindness. And brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be buried up.